Good morning and welcome to today's new HERA webcast. Um, before I hand over to Justin Miller, uh, CEO of New HERA, I just wanted to briefly recap the question process. We've received a number of questions online um, uh, ahead of the, the webcast via email. So we'll go through those, but the process to ask questions online, you will see uh, in your window on the platform uh, a question icon. Um, feel free to text through any questions. Justin will go through the questions at the end of his uh, presentation just to uh, keep the flow. So with that, I would like to now hand over to Justin. Thank you, Steve, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I, uh, I trust uh, we've got a healthy set of attendees today and uh, thank you for, for your attendance. I, uh, I trust everyone is keeping safe and well. Um, we have attendees from, from all around the world, which is uh, very encouraging to, to see. Um, we'll get straight into it. Over the course of the presentation, my intention is not to present the presentation in minute detail, um, but to, uh, to recap as we are doing every quarter now. Um, some of our progress in uh, in certain areas. Um, so uh, so with that, for those that haven't attended, we will cover some background, and uh, and more importantly, we'll we'll go through uh, what's happened over the course of the last quarter um, since since we last presented in uh, in February. It's uh, no doubt the world has changed uh, quite significantly, and uh, I think through a COVID crisis, the the company has performed um, very well, and uh, it is. Uh, that that we actually want to spend a little bit of time on today and, uh, and give you some more clarity around uh, where we're headed and uh, more in particular where hearing health is headed uh, on, a, on a global scale. Um, and I think this is more significant than it ever has been that uh, you know, we are providing smart and affordable multi-purpose hearing solutions. That's that's what we we're founded on. And uh, most importantly, we're, we're focused on a part of the market that's not being serviced with traditional hearing solutions today. So what does that mean? We, we are very much positioned for growth in 2020, despite um, the, the, the current COVID uh, crisis that's uh, inflicting the world. Um, we, why? Um, we've, we've built up a, a position pretty much over over the last four or five years that's, uh, that's seen us now um, uh, with hearing healthcare at home, really really put ourselves in a position to, uh, to maximise um, our opportunity. And that comes through leading products. We've, we've gone from prototype to, to millions in revenue and, and now our third generation of product with IQ Buds 2 Max launched at, uh, at CES this year. Um, the opportunity, um, by our calculations, um, a $10 billion plus new category, um, there's, um, you know, and it is to a certain extent providing some disruption to the um, rather large $8 billion um, hearing aid or, or clinic market that, that really does uh, ignore the mild to moderate hearing challenges. Um, not necessarily from a point of view that the products won't work, but certainly from the point of view in relation to accessibility and affordability and multi-purpose. So, um, so that, that has been our focus and continues to be our focus. And more importantly for us, Broadening hearing healthcare as a market for um, essentially uh, hearing aids are for hearing loss. Um, our hearing buds are for hearing healthcare on a more broader scale. So we're supporting a lot of different aspects of, of the hearing healthcare market, uh, not just here in Australia, but globally. Our competitive strengths, we've invested a lot in, uh, in R&D. Um, you know, with a hardware and a software product, it, it does take a lot to actually bring products to market. Um, I think on a global scale, we've done that very efficiently over the last uh, um, three or four years. And as I say, our third generation product with accessories, we're in a very good position to, to maximise our return now. Um, we're well first from a hearing perspective, self-fit, self-assess, auto configuration. Um, and if we look at what's happened in the world today, um, a very important aspect of that is people being able to access our product from the comfort of their own home, um, having that product delivered to their home and then being able to um, self-fit, self-assess, auto-configure is, is pretty significant. So it's something we've been advocating for a number of years now, 
very importantly, we're now in the process of being able to uh, uh, to not only execute but but grow on that execution, and that's really happening through um, our online sales strategy and our ability to go out and find customers in the mild to moderate with mild to moderate hearing challenges. Um, not they're not necessarily looking um, as probably they are with a hearing loss and hearing aid, so that takes a lot of um, I guess understanding, experience, and intellectual property now that we've built up to 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 go out and access those particular customers, and that's been built up through millions of hours of of, uh, of hearing data. And what's all that leading to? Well, it's leading to sales traction. And uh, so for us, um, you know, we've uh, we've got four plus years in hearing retail, and that really is an oxymoron. Um, you know, no, hearing retail hasn't necessarily exist. Um, uh, in uh, in a more traditional fashion, it's been through hearing clinics and and through audiologists who do serve a very important purpose, but we're looking for a different uh, customer here, and we're looking for a different approach to market. So this hearing retail experience we built up is pretty significant. A little bit of background. Um, importantly, um, the the boards had a, a, a tremendous impact on on our business and the growth of that board, and uh, uh, we're we're now in a position that um, um, that that board is. Uh, is, is, is having a lot of um, a lot of benefit, and that that goes around um, uh, the uh, uh, the input in terms of uh, um, the, the capital raising and uh, and the more broader experience. So so from that perspective, um, we're um, in a much stronger position, and we, and we continue to grow um, and uh, and gel together as a board. Um, the executive team done an exemplary job over over the last quarter. Um, so in conjunction with the board of directors, delivered austerity, delivered direction, and you know, importantly, uh, still delivering growth. So a very important part of uh, our makeup um, and a little bit of our, uh, about our market cap and, and uh, cash position. So um, I'll, uh, I'll touch on the SPP um, and, uh, and our cash towards the end of the uh, um, presentation and uh, cover that through questions as well. Um, I will say at this point that we did release a letter to shareholders in the SPP documents um, this morning. So please, uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to do that, perhaps uh, review that through the course of the presentation and uh, hopefully that may answer some of your questions as well. Um, but uh, yeah, um, please reach out with those questions as, uh, as Steve pointed out uh, through the course of the presentation. Um, the opportunity, well, the opportunity for us uh, without spending too much time on this slide um, if we look at the, the bottom there, hearing loss is on the rise um, and its prevalence is expected to almost double by the year 2050, uh, according to the World Health Organization. So hearing loss per se and, and the upper echelons of the hearing loss uh, market is, is not where we're targeting, but it is a growth market. Um, and unfortunately it's a growth market, but you know, it is the market we're in. And, and, and fortunately we're, we're in a position to be able to provide assistance to those that are, that are seeking it at a much earlier opportunity. Um, but if I can point you to the top right hand uh, point in that slide, one in five um, teenagers now suffer some form of hearing loss. So it's 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 something that uh, that is on the rise at a much earlier age. And uh, you know when we see the average age of a hearing loss uh, hearing aid wearer at 72, there's a lot of opportunity to provide assistance. Um, but importantly, um, a, a greater opportunity to provide education as well. Um, so the market opportunity, what, what is our sweet spot? Well, as I said, um, from a hearing loss perspective, the hearing aid companies do a really good job at the higher levels of hearing loss. Their penetration rates are somewhere 50 to 70% across um, the more severe and presound um, types of hearing loss. But that results in the median hearing age, uh, hearing aid wearer being 72 years of age. So they do a really good job at the upper echelons of the market. At the bottom end of the market, the mild to moderate hearing challenges, we see very little penetration. Um, and given that we start losing our hearing at about the average age of 35, um, there is a huge opportunity there, decades where people go without. Um, and, and it is those, uh, those people where we're trying to provide a more broader hearing solution um, to, uh, um, to fill what we believe is a, a, a massive hearing gap. And clearly, when you look at it in these contexts, you can see that there is a, uh, a very large market that's, that's really been, uh, whether it's underserviced or untapped, um, the end result is um, there are a lot of people going without. So um, that, is, that is our opportunity. And 30 million people in the US alone 
uh, are not having their hearing, their hearing needs service today. So huge opportunity for our business. And that hasn't changed. And we've been on message and I'm on this message for, for a number of years now. So the new solution, um, very quickly, um, what we're not, well, we're not, um, although we do all the headphone functions in relation to, um, particularly with IQ Buds 2 Max now, uh, ANC music, uh, phone calls, um, we do all that. Um, it's not necessarily we're focused. So we're not Apple AirPods, we're not the Galaxy Buds, um, we're not a traditional headphone per se, um, although we do, that is an important part of our functionality. Um, it's, but that part of the market is a really low margin, high volume um, part of the market. And it's not where we're, uh, not where we're focused. We, we've, we've over the course pivoted upwards um, into more sophisticated um, hearing um, type um, processing. Um, but to that extent, we're also not a hearing aid. Hearing aids are designed for um, hearing loss and they're very high margin, low volume market. So 13 to 14 million devices sold per annum every year. Um, and five companies have 95% of the, the global hearing aid market. Um, and those five companies have uh, anywhere between 30, own 30 to 50% of the hearing clinics as well. So it's really, it's a very tight market um, and, and one that's, um, we believe, um, a broader solution is 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 required in order to to access this this mild to moderate hearing challenges where where we can introduce smart smart hearing and uh, you know even if you look at a 30% penetration rate in that particular part of the market in relation to the previous slide you know an average sell price between four and five hundred dollars and I'm pleased to say you know our ASP is now upwards of four hundred fifty dollars um, and it was. In the in the low 200s, a matter of years ago, we've 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 done a great job in driving ourselves up the up the ladder in relation to um, um, not over the top costs, um, but a but a cost that sees uh, um, our ability to um, to make our business um, profitable. Um, so from from that perspective, we also see an extension of the smart hearing category into the over the counter hearing aid legislation that was due to be. Um, enacted um, on August 2020. Um, I, uh, we're yet to hear whether that will go ahead. Um, the early indicators, are, well not the early indicators, the late indicators are that it won't um, in the sense that uh, it'll be pushed back. Um, and that's obviously due to the COVID-19 situation, the FDA um, having a lot to do there. So uh, um, I, we, we're yet to receive any official notification on whether that will still take place from August. Um, but given that they do need a time period to for, for everyone to review, um, the suggestion is that that may be pushed into 2021. However, for us, it still represents an opportunity. Um, you know, there, there'll be new legislation that will actually um, enable us to, to um, produce a hearing aid um, and understanding what um, um, the specifications of that product will ultimately be and also the potential for us to, to push into a, uh, a slightly higher price point. Um, but given that we've, we've got the tech in our, in our hearing buds, um, you know, there's, there's a huge opportunity there to, to drive um, some product diversification into, into the OTC um, part of the market. Um, so any of you products with broader appeal, just to set the tone as to where we fit for those that, that, are, that are unsure um, in the hearing space, um, at the very top of the, the tree, um, there is the, the cochlear um, type devices which require th surgery and a 30, cus 30 plus K investment. Um, the audiologists, so they're all day wear devices, hearing amplification designed for hearing loss. Um, it's somewhere between four to 15 K. So it's not um, an inexpensive uh, undertaking. And then where we fit. So the, this, this bottom end of the market that's really um, uh, remained uh, Underserviced, um, and and that's through through a number of different factors. Um, um, and uh, I'll, I'll touch on um, some of those factors in more detail later in the presentation. But a lot of it's to do with the widget, um, the hearing widget, um, and uh, that's what we've designed is a more situational wear device. So something you take on and take off, and not necessarily wear all day. But it's personalised, has entertainment and communication functions. It's convenient. It's a normal form factor. It's non-prosthetic. Um, so you look the same as everyone else, and uh, Apple have done a fantastic job in in driving uh, acceptance of, uh, of wireless earbuds. So from that perspective, um, that's something we 
we couldn't have anticipated uh, when we first started uh, with our, our wireless uh, buds uh, many years ago, but it, it's something that's become more normal today. There's a normalisation of having things in your ear. And in, and in turn, that, that appeals to a much younger audience, which is exactly what we're after. You know, we're, we're after those people that sit between 35 and 70. Um, and obviously cost is an important factor there in, in driving those changes. So a new category, um, which takes a new hearing widget. But for us, it's, it's turning that four, four or five years of experience now into, into significant opportunity. 40 plus thousand pairs sold globally. Um, the average age of our customer is, is 54 years, um, which is significantly uh, in advance of the average hearing aid wearer, which was where we designed the target. Right, and importantly for us, you know, we 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 hear a lot about the, the COVID uh, situation and how teleaudiology or telehealth uh, more broadly is uh, is being delivered to consumers today. Um, for us, uh, that's always been inactive. We, we've we've always uh, been connected to our to our uh, to our users, which is something fairly unique in the hearing world. Um, and uh, and being connected um, through the app through through, through our customers, we've accumulated millions of hours of data. So we understand our customers very well, but we have a means to constantly um, communicate with them. And, and for us, that's pretty significant. So things that we've been advocating for, for a number of years around uh, constant um, contact with our, with our, with our uh, customers is something we're seeing now more broadly um, um, being moved into, into uh, um, the upper echelons of, of audiology. And that's through necessity. Um, and uh, um, through hearing clinics being shuttered pretty much globally, so so for us, we're, we're, we we believe to ourselves to be leaders in this particular space, and uh, and that's given us um, a huge amount of data. Um, but importantly, it's for our from from our perspective, it's validating that sweet spot. Um, we're we're getting our customers 18 years in advance of hearing aid users. So as hearing aid users, yes, upper echelons of hearing loss. Um, hearing aids are designed for hearing loss. Our hearing buds um, are designed for a more broader hearing health care. Um, so from, from that perspective, great opportunity and it's validated and we're validating it through this particular set of data. To give you an update on our on our um, um, where we're at, I've touched on this slide previously, you know, we're not into that mass sales point yet. We, we've we spent a number of years through R&D, product development, manufacture and sales distribution. And, uh, you know, we've, we've been in hearing retail with some of the biggest retailers uh, across the world um, and uh, learning a lot about um, the hearing customer. I guess the one thing that we have discovered over the course of that journey is that um, no one goes shopping for hearing. Um, it, it's, it's just it's something that's left to, to older wage, but no one's going into a Best Buy looking for hearing. So be able to, to be able to target that particular customer um, opportunistically in a store is quite remote. So the things that we learn, and we tried a number of different things, and um, you know, to their credit, none of these retailers have necessarily given up. Um, um, we've looked at a number of different things, but where we're having most success now is our direct to consumer and our online business, and, and that's where we see significant growth in, in our business and, and where ultimately, um, particularly in the shorter term, um, success will continue. And that's how we build our, our mass sales. Um, hearing healthcare retail, as I said, there was no blueprint for smart hearing products, the category all, re all retail. So well, there's been a, a lot of learnings about that in terms of um, you know, hearing devices are not sold on a peg on a store. It, it takes some assisted sales um, and it's also not a spontaneous uh, purchase. Um, but what we've also learned is price doesn't drive sales. Um, it's about solving real problems for people. And uh, with our hearing widgets, we've, we've ultimately done that. So hearing health is a positive and hearing loss is pretty much a negative, particularly when you're trying to pitch people online. So we've moved all those learnings into what we're doing online. And you know, we're having greater sales success because of it. Um, and we're also moving our success from a um, from an online perspective into hybrid models with, with our other customers. Most recently, that was uh, announcements we had with Walgreens. Um, so that um, is in its earliest, early phases in terms of where we go. Um, ultimately, um, it's their front end, um, but 
our back end and, and our ability to uh, to drop ship with with Walgreens labelling from from our warehousing. So it's it's a good relationship. Um, we 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 ultimately want to move any of these hybrid retail relationships more in line with um, our ability to create hooks for these particular customers. They've got massive um, databases of, of, of or membership bases, sorry, um, that we believe we can overlay with with our uh, customer profiles and uh, and start the target market. We had to move into the specifics of that, but it's as I said, it's they're great relationships that we expect to uh, to get some some pretty significant growth out, particularly with the new product um, over the course of the next couple of quarters. Um, and you'll see us working more. So there, there'll, there'll be more than the Walgreens. Um, a lot of these retailers, uh, even Best Buy now, where we're revisiting as to how we actually uh, promote uh, our, our products because there's a huge opportunity um, that we really haven't undertaken other than having the product online. There's a huge opportunity to use, utilise our marketing assets in and, and their membership base in a, in a way to actually attract more customers. So um, there, there, there will be some, um, some further developments there. Um, defining our hearing retail success, well, why is there little penetration in the mild to moderate hearing customer? Well, um, historically, people have put off the purchase of hearing device to beyond. It's quite expensive and it's a very time consuming process. So, um, and as I pointed out previously, mild to moderate hearing customers are generally not looking for hearing solutions in any form of retail. No one goes shopping for hearing, um, just doesn't happen. I, I'd like to think that over time that that will change. Um, as, as um, hearing healthcare broadens and, uh, and, uh, and more products become available, um, but there's no real foot traffic that goes out looking for it. Um, so that means you've got a, a, an audiological process um, that's very unique, quite specific, um, but very expensive and very time consuming. And you're just not gonna convert an early, you know, someone with a, um, a mild to moderate hearing challenge into that particular um, product. So. What we've done is approach this mild to moderate hearing customer um, with, with a very, very different approach. And that's where direct to consumer has actually been very, very impactful for us. Um, we know who the hearing customer is and actually how to find them. And this is an integral part of the company's intellectual property now. One aspect of it is the, is the hearing widget or the hearing gadget, and that's world leading, great, great awards um, and, uh, and, uh, and the like. But Another aspect of our business and where we spent significant effort um, is, is around our direct-to-consumer approach. So over many years, we've tested thousands of hearing avatars or profiles on potential customers. Um, so we've refined these into what are now eight distinct um, avatars or profiles that we advertise to globally. And these avatars um, provide us with the best conversion to a sale. So when we look at um, the different aspects of the hearing market. Uh, hearing aid manufacturers sell to audiologists and audiologists then prescribe devices to um, hearing aid devices to, to, uh, to individuals. What we look at is um, look at it in a different way. People aren't necessarily going out shopping for hearing. So what we do is using these eight different avatars is, is market to them online. Um, and uh, um, these eight avatars um, importantly, are providing us with uh, with the ability to reach these customers irrespective of their um, geographical location. So these avatars are working as well for us in the US as they are in the UK, and we're getting significant growth out of those areas um, uh, even now. So we were in this position where um, you know hearing aid companies have have seen their their, their clinic shuttered and their revenue lines drop we're in the position that we understand who our customer is and are able to reach them online. There are many more eyes on screens at the moment. So our ability to reach them is through this, um, these, uh, these avatars and our, and our ability to understand who that customer is. So, and we bring them then through a whole full digital marketing funnel. So we advertise to them, we educate them and, uh, and ultimately leads us to, to a conversion um, of, of, of a sale. So how are we doing that? six simple steps really um, from a hearing healthcare journey perspective. So step one is about education, creating that hook. Step two, we actually get them in to do a hearing test. And I think this is a very, it's, it's an integral part of what we offer because, and importantly, it's an important thing to understand where we don't compete with hearing aids is we screen in as much as, we, we screen out as much as we screen in. 
So there's actually 30% of the people that, that sit our hearing test that we actually advise to go and see an audiologist. So we're not a threat to the audiological community. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, there, there's a real opportunity for, for substantial uh, partnerships here in the sense that uh, you know, we understand our target market, um, but we also understand there are some hearing needs that are, that are more challenging than what um, our hearing widget offers. So this is, this is integral in, in part of that. So creating that community and making, allowing people to understand where they fit from a hearing perspective, because there's not a lot of places you can go to find out about your hearing. Um, you can do that with most other things in your, in your, from a healthcare perspective, but hearing is one of those things that you know, patient-centered care has never been really an option. That's changed with COVID. Um, we're seeing everything move to online and we're in a really, really good position now to be able to execute on that. The, the, the crisis has, has highlighted the issues we've been advocating for, for a long time. And, uh, you know, encouragingly, we're, we're seeing that continue to, uh, to execute through, through the course of this crisis. So you know, step three is you get it delivered to your house. Um, and uh, step four, personalise it through your ear ID. Step five, it customises to your own hearing profile. And step six is you're in this continual constant state of assessment. So this, this telehealth perspective where we're in constant communication. So your hearing will deteriorate over time and will provide an understanding of that. And when we're picking up customers 18 years in advance, um, of traditional hearing aid wearers, this may be an opportunity for them to, to move into hearing aids at a, at a much earlier age. So, so for us, performing a, a very valuable um, service as part of um, the hearing health care uh, spectrum. So selling direct to the to consumer, um, how do we do that? Seven sites globally um, that we, we deal in different currencies. Um, North America and the UK actually remain our, our largest, uh, our largest uh, customer bases. Um, in fact, we're, you know, we're experiencing year-on-year uh, -year growth in, in those areas. And when you think about, you know, really um, who's been impacted hardest by, by COVID, it is the US and, and the UK, um, but they still remain our, our largest markets. In fact, we're experiencing growth in those markets. And I think that represents significant opportunity for us over the next couple of quarters. Um, and um, so for us is, is proof that our our, uh, our marketing and our campaigning is working as well. Our avatars are working now as well in the UK as they did in the in the in the US. So we, the, these 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 are things that we can take globally and and execute on. And you know we're driving sales through you know the more traditional means Google, Facebook, Instagram. Um, so we'll continue to do that. Um, we're seeing our direct to consumer advertising spend. So our, our return on advertising spend you know stay. Um, above two times. So we, we know that for every dollar we spend, we're getting between two and $2.50 return in revenue. Um, and we can, you can plot a path forward in terms of break even position. So companies now in a position where it needs to spend to get there. And this is part of the reasoning around, you know, a, some, some capital raising to support this particular part of the market. We're getting growth in a COVID economy um, in, in uh, really basket cases of retail environments. Um, and um, we're maintaining our return on advertising spend. Um, so they're encouraging signs and, uh, and should be taken at face value that this business um, does understand how to reach a customer and how to do it in a way um, that can, uh, can see the, the, the business scale um, considerably. Um, it's a very sophisticated um, marketing automation framework that we go through, and there is a slide in the appendices if anyone is interested in, in how we bring people through. Um, but, but importantly, we're, we're doing that in-house, in um, where we're not dependent on outside retailers, sending our product away, hoping that it sells on a, hoping they get their marketing right in the store. You know, we, we're, we're managing this on an hourly type basis, uh, managing our advertising spend, managing where it's spent, um, you know, and, and understanding where, things are moving and not moving, even in the US, you know, we, we can see that, you know, New York hasn't moved for us in the last sort of five or six weeks. And that's understandable given the impact that COVID's had on New York, but we can see where other parts of the US are spending. And so you can redirect your spend in that regard as well. So very, very sophisticated engine and, uh, and something that's um, integral to, uh, to our success as we move forward. And importantly, 
you know, as much as we have an understanding about where our direct-to-consumer model going, it's now being supported by a completely new um, new product, our IQBuds 2 Max. And, uh, you know, the geographical breakdown of sales um, and considering these sales are still, you know, people are still committing to this in a pre-order sense. Um, I, I will say that from a manufacturing point of view, we were able to return to, um, we got dispensation to return to um, to production um, mid mid in April. So that's enabled us to uh, to re-engage our, our manufacturing, um, which is uh, which encouraging for everyone. And it, it, uh, it did have some impact and has um, slowed us down. Um, we have been able to maintain um, pretty much all those uh, those pre-order sales. People are understanding of the of the of the COVID uh, the COVID situation, and uh, you know we've lost um, well very very minimal um, customers in relation to 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 the to the delays. Um, so we're we're in the process of um, I guess uh, um, turning on our production line again. Um, that's not without difficulty doing that remotely, given that we can't be in the plant, but something that we are um, bringing up to speed and uh, and hopefully over the course of the next couple of weeks uh, or the next yeah series of weeks, we're in the process of, uh, of shipping our first product. So um, there's a bit more to do. Um, there are some challenges in terms of sending product backward and forward as we as we do different um, as we as we bring the production line up. But um, you know I'm I'm encouraged by the development that's been made and um, yeah, provide an indication that uh, you know we are on target um, to uh, to see some um, um, some product out of that that particular um, factory over the course of uh, the coming weeks. Um, and something that uh, we also anticipated was the IQ store for for IQ Buds Two Max. Um, it's still on the cards. Um, again, we've had different priorities around. Um, what has been our focus? Our focus has been on returning ourselves to to uh, to manufacturing. Uh, once that's complete, we're up uh, mass production. We've got uh, free stock, and we we've got a, a growing list of back orders. Um, encouraging you now, we're starting to see those um, some of the retailers place um, advance orders now, um, uh, or distributors now in parts that will for for this uh, Cubas Two Max. So it's not just our direct to consumer. Um, so we're um, probably in a position that uh, you know it'll be June timeframe before you're in any, uh, and maybe even beyond, based on where the orders are still progressing, before we are in a posi position to have um, free stock. But um, there are encouraging signs that uh, people want the product, people love the product, and we can continue to grow through over the course of the coming quarters. Um, beyond 2020, we do have this OTC strategy. I believe it. It'll take a you know. We, we can dominate a complete hearing category solution, both online and in-store, um, through what we offer. And that is our hearing buds range, um, the hearing kiosk um, to screen, educate, provide knowledge, hearing accessories, a TV streamer. Um, we're looking at uh, different types of Bluetooth dongles and the like. Um, so from a hearing accessories perspective, and then to round that out through uh, an OTC hearing aid, which is, you know, has the potential to, to really um, extend our customer base, um, introduce new customers, but also extend our customer base potentially beyond um, the, the hearing budge uh, and, and, and mild hearing challenges. So the COVID crisis for us is, is, is certainly not diminishing our opportunity. You know, we're seeing changing global market conditions. Um, you know, we're continuing to, to, to grow and present disruption to a traditional hearing industry. They, they've been massively disrupted. Um, we've seen them uh, move quite quickly to to now providing teleaudiology uh, solutions, which is fantastic. Um, probably something that uh, that could have happened um, uh, many years ago, but uh, but is now starting to happen. And necessity is the mother of invention in that regard. And, and it's great to see that the customers have more options, um, because for us, hearing health starts at home. This is how we attract our customers and um, this patient-centered hearing healthcare is, is a must and it happens in all forms of healthcare today but it really hasn't happened in hearing and this is this is changing the landscape for, for us and, and our understanding of that direct-to-consumer market and our ability to understand who that customer is is ultimately driving that. OTC as and when it is implemented um, again provides us with, with another opportunity to potentially enter the, the hearing aid market. Um, so um, so from that perspective, 
there is significant opportunity. And if if there was ever a um, a reason to think, well, is OTC a good solution? Just look at what the COVID crisis has done. That that it, it's it's changed the landscape of hearing healthcare. I think forever, um, in the sense that with with these clinics shuttered, the need for OTC type products has never been um, more obvious. You know, for the for, for the ability to people, we go pick things up, self fit, self assess, auto configure a product to suit their own hearing needs. This is showing that it's an absolute necessity, and uh, I think you know it doesn't replace you know the more complex things that are required from an audiological perspective, but it does show that there is a need for 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 other products in the market today, and you know you know the lack of um, um, self-service hearing solutions um, is 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 having a deep impact on on some of the sales service. I, I I saw an article today that one of the one of the big five has had a 80% drop in uh, in uh, in hearing aid sales over the course of the last month or so, and that's that's quite dramatic, and it's understandable because that their model has been relied on has relied on um, audiological and clinic based uh, interventions. And if you think about uh, their industry, their 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 customer base is the most vulnerable. The average age of a hearing aid wearer is 72. Um, so if you think about who comes out of this last? It is it is the hearing aid industry. Um, their 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 customers are most vulnerable. It must move to a to a more um, I guess uh, um, patient centered um, type care type offering. And uh, for for us, we're already there, and uh, that represents significant opportunity. So why new hearer? We launched as a first mover in the hearing healthcare pace. Um, identified a, as as we've said, a ten billion dollar market opportunity. Um, we're developing a new market segment with a clear unmet need, but importantly, we've validated it. Our, you know, our customer base is around that 50 years of age, um, and uh, um, we've got a you know a, a lot of data that supports um, our entry into that particular space has has been a good one. Uh, we're pioneering smart hearing. Um, we're focused we're focused on a particular part of that market that is really underserviced today, and uh, most importantly, we've got a a new hearing widget. Um, um, that uh, that we launched this year that that's world class and uh, and provides us with a good platform on which to uh, to generate sales over over the next couple of years. We're achieving growth in scalable um, uh, sales channels as well. So we're not dependent on what's happening in the Australian economy. Um, and as I said, we've we've got the ability to 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 really read on a daily basis as to where our spend is being applied and how we can get a return on our, uh, on our investment there. So a significant growth opportunity. And, uh, and for us, you know, this is a, a great Aussie technology that is being deployed globally and, uh, and ultimately is now positioned very well for, uh, for growth over the next couple of quarters. So um, with that, we'll probably uh, move into some, some questions. Steve, um, just touch on the SPP uh, very briefly. Is that we did uh, we did put uh, the offer out, the offer open today. Um, it's open for three weeks. Uh, there is a letter that that accompanies that um, that uh, provides some detail on uh, on the reasoning uh, behind it. Um, and uh, you know, importantly for us, um, it was you know we 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 are unsure as many are many bigger companies other than us whether it's an uh, a NAB ANZ or, or otherwise uh, uh, are building their treasuries because it is an uncertain market. Uh, we're no different. Cochlear even, you know, raised the raised the billion dollars. And uh, so f from that perspective, you know, board decision um, in the sense of, uh, you know, making sure that we're, we're in a position to continue the momentum that we've got, um, continue the investment in our, uh, our uh, direct-to-consumer play um, and, uh, and continue to, to build inventory to support it. And uh, so with that, um, the SPP, um, not necessarily a huge, we're, we're, we're very pleased to be um, at least partially underwritten um, by, by Canaccord, um, but, but not huge, but we did want to give our shareholders the, the first right to be able to participate. We know that the share price has been rocked as, as most have. And uh, um, from our perspective, it was very important that we gave our loyal base of shareholders the opportunity to uh, to have first rights on uh, on any raise that we ultimately were were doing. So there, there's some reasoning there as to as to why we've gone about it. 
um, the most important aspect of it is that we we don't want to lose momentum. Um, and uh, you know, um, COVID is not necessarily um, um, uh, hugely detrimental to to our prospects over the course of the next two quarters. I will also say that you know, for those shareholders that subscribe at um, a ten thousand dollars or more, we've also put uh, the uh, the ability there to uh, to receive a complimentary set of um, IQ Buds Two Max. Um, they will be provided at the end of uh, our back order. Um, we obviously need to serve those customers first, um, but it, importantly, it's an opportunity for for our again our law shareholder base who are who are investing in our product to actually um, have that product test drive your investment in in what is world leading Australian technology. Um, so we saw that as a, as a good opportunity to to provide that to to our shareholders. Um, so Steve, I think we'll uh, we'll look to uh, answer some questions. Uh, thanks, Justin. I'll start with the questions we received online, and, and probably the best place to start is on the SPP with um, uh, uh, a fairly common question, uh, which is. Um, are you and uh, the other directors planning to take up your full allocations in the SPP? Uh, yes, uh, as we put in the letter today, that uh, you know, it's very difficult for us as directors to find a window to actually um, to buy shares. And I, I know that there there is some uh, uh, rather, um, uh, I guess, um, there's big opinions out there on what we shouldn't be doing. But um, you know, it is difficult, and uh, the SPP does provide us with the opportunity. And you know, those that are eligible will be. Uh, um, um, certainly, be participating in uh, in this uh, in this particular part of, part of the process. So, and I, for one, am am uh, am there definitely. Uh, thanks, Justin. Probably related to that, you, you've um, pretty much asked uh, answered this. Uh, it's about you and uh, David as co-founders uh, buying shares on market. And why haven't you done more? Yeah, look at. I think I did touch on that um, in the sense that it is, you know, our our windows of opportunities are uh, are not very open. Um, the, the number of blackout periods are there are a number of, and there's information that we're ultimately aware of. So there's it's not a lot of times where we're able to participate in these sorts of things. So um, you know, here here is an opportunity where we can, and uh, we certainly we certainly will. Um, so from that perspective, um, yeah. Um, as and when we can, we will. Thanks, Justin. Uh, you mentioned in the shareholder letter that there is an offer to shareholders with regards to the device. There is a question here about, I suppose generally, offers to shareholders regarding purchases of hearing devices. Um, can you perhaps comment on that? Yeah, we do. Um, we do offer shareholder discounts, and uh, um, I think that shareholder discount um, and, and they need to be applied for. They're, they're one-off discounts. So if shareholders do want access to it, then uh, they ring our, our customer care, and um, we can provide uh, access to, uh, to to discounts for shareholders. Um, but as I said, as part of the SPP as well, we are offering the ability for, for people to get a complimentary set um, based on certain levels of investment. So, um, so there are a couple of opportunities for for shareholders to take advantage of uh, either discounts or, or as we said, this. Uh, this, uh, this complimentary set through investment in the SPP. Uh, just moving on to sales, how many IQ Buds 2 Max have been sold to date? And um, perhaps if you can clarify the, the first delivery date. Um, yeah, look, first delivery date, that, that's still that's still something that we're, we haven't got a definitive timeline on. As I said, we're we're a lot closer to that. We've resumed um, our uh, manufacturing um, as part of the uh, the dispensation we got for the plant to open early in Malaysia because they are in um, what is still a total lockdown to, to mid-May. Um, they're running at 50% capacity. Um, and in the early phases of, uh, of, I guess, restarting our manufacturing, it's not necessarily impacting us too much at the moment um, in terms of that 50% capacity, but we hope towards the back end of uh, April, oh, sorry, April, back end of May, that we're certainly up to um, the plants up to 100% capacity, and uh, um, we uh, we're in a position to uh, to be shipping before the before the end of the month. That's for sure. And sorry, was there another part to that question as well? 
Um, no, it was uh, well. Uh, how many have been sold today? Oh, look, yeah, from a from a numbers perspective, that that continues to grow. Um, so uh, I think we're well and truly above um, uh, three thousand direct to consumer orders, but but more importantly, we're starting to see retail um, um, orders um, kick in now as well. So. Um, I don't think I'll put specific numbers out there, so I won't necessarily do that today, but um, um, that's, uh, the numbers are still trending in the right direction, that's for sure. Great, thanks, Justin. A question on takeover and OEM. Um, but basically, have there been any more takeover and OEM talks? <laughs> uh, look, the old, it, it's, it, the old chestnut, um, ever since in terms of what happened last year, look, we, um, I will say we're not overtly seeking that. I think the chair actually addressed that last time. Um, if we are forging a new market with new products, um, that, that, that's our focus and that remains our focus. If, if we get that right, if we continue to scale, then I would suggest that we're going to be of, um, of greater appeal to, to, to a, both those ends of the spectrum. You've got the consumer electronics end, but you've also, you know, got a hearing industry as well, um, particularly in, in this type of environment. So, so from that perspective, we keep executing. Um, you know, we're 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 here to build a a significant global business, and um, you know, if, if but we're a public company, so I can't necessarily stop those, those approaches. Um, but you know, from our perspective, our focus remains solely on. Uh, on execution, on, on delivering this product and uh, an execution of uh, direct to consumer uh, and hybrid type uh, retail sales. Okay, thanks. Um, I think you discussed this in your presentation. Uh, when will the OTC regulations be revealed? In short, we don't know. Um, that's the honest answer there. Um, it was, as I said, due to be in, uh, enacted by August 2020. Um, the world has changed in the last three months, so um, expectation is that that may well get pushed out. Um, I think it'll have to get pushed out, quite frankly. There needs to be a review period of, of whatever they release from a specification point of view of what is an OTC hearing aid. Um, so I, I would think that that would uh, push out into possibly um, 2021. Um, but for us, you know, it's uh, not necessarily impacting how we're going about things at the at the other end of the spectrum, anyway. So, um, it does I think represent opportunity for us? But uh, but for us, it's uh, um, again focusing on what we can do and what we can achieve through um, IQBuds 2 Max and our direct to consumer. Right. Just a quick follow up on that that just popped up online. Um, uh, it says that your slide says specifications are by April 2020. The what? Sorry. Your slide. That's, that's what we anticipated. Sorry. So, um, my apologies if that's well, it's slipped into May now. Um, so I could up, I can continually push that out May, June, July, August, and you know they may well release it um, over the course of um, the, the next few months. But uh, no one uh, is really of any great knowledge as to when that that's going to come out. So, the um, yeah, apologies that that could be May. In fact, it's. Um, um, the expectation is that it's due um, because uh, what they did say was that there'd be a six month review period of those specifications once they are handed down. So um, obviously we're, you know, if, if, if that is still true and it's released in May, then it'll be later this year before it's enacted. So um, I just don't understand necessarily the legalities around how that could be changed given it's been signed into law. So, um, and, and, you know, the advice we're getting is, uh, is unclear on that as well. Great. Uh, and again, just a, another follow-up online on um, your participation in the raising, just to clarify that whether the directors will be taking out their maximum entitlement of $30,000. Oh, well, I guess that's, um, from, from our perspective, um, um, yeah, the, the intention is to ultimately uh, to uh, to participate at the at a at the highest possible level that we can. Um, so from from our perspective, um, you know, I've had great support from from a number of major shareholders as well. So, you know, uh, our our view is that uh, yeah, we're we're in there, and uh, and I think you know, across the board, you know, the, the director support 
um, the austerity measures that have been delivered, we're, we're really putting the, the company in a, in a strong position as we possibly can. And, uh, you know, from, from that perspective, I, I get it. I get why people want to see us participate, um, but we're, we're delivering on a number of fronts in return in terms of um, what's, what's required from, from, uh, from the directors over, over the course of the next couple of quarters, that's for sure. Great, I think we can rule a line under that one. Um, just moving on, what will determine when staffing and salary to, uh, salaries return to pre-COVID levels? Um, is the decision dependent on government? What will it be? Look, changing, changing world, changing landscape. Again, our focus comes down to um, delivering product and continuing what we're doing from a direct-to-consumer perspective. Um, we'd set a 30 June review date, um, given that we still yet to ship product. Give it so there's, you know, there's a lot of attention that we've got um, in getting that that product shipped um, and out of manufacture. Um, so I think, you know, we we put it out there that it'll be reviewed on June 30, and and that's that's the expectation that uh, that we still got today. Um, so nothing nothing will change in 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 that regard, um, at least at the shorter term. We've got to, we've got to focus on uh, on getting this product out. Great. Um, a question on R&D. Is New Hero still eligible for R&D tax rebates? Um, when is this likely and, and how much approximately? Yeah, good question. Um, yes, we are. Um, and yes, it'll run into you know a, uh, um, a similar result to, to previous years in terms of uh, return for us. Um, so that closes June 30. Um, I think uh, um, there will, there will be a lot of people wanting to access it, I would imagine, post June 30. Um, so for, from our perspective, you know, we'll, we'll be one of them as well. So yeah, it does provide uh, 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 quite a significant um, injection of cash into the business, um, which in previous years has been above seven figures and that's the expectation again this year. So, um, so yes, a, a, a good opportunity and one that we're on top of. Great. Um, uh... Moving on to advertising, what are your plans for advertising? Um, radio, TV, um, e emails, uh, endorsements, YouTube, there's a whole list of things here. Uh, happens every second of the day, you know, and as I say, you know, that, that uh, direct to consumer um, marketing, sales and marketing model is, uh, is uh, working while we sleep. So it's, uh, it's something we continue to do. We use all those. Um, as I say, if we could, you could point to a slide that shows um, the the level of detail. In fact, go to it if you if if you like. Um, in terms of um, the the appendices, um, it's it's quite a complex um, process. Um, that up the front, we are using YouTube ads. Where you know, um, Taboola Native Service has a whole integrated system here. Facebook, um, Google. There's a whole lot of things that we're using that that we target our avatars towards. So, um, and importantly, everything that we do here to bring people through this funnel and ultimately through a transaction is now independently validated by external data. So there's four plus years of hearing champions, media, product reviews, and support that support the whole process. So we can bring people into our funnel um, as and when they do. And uh, I'm a purchaser as well online. I always like to check third party sources and uh, importantly, there's, there's uh, um, you know, a raft of information now out there from third party um, providers, uh, reviews and such that, that endorse our product. So a very complex model and, and, and one that hasn't necessarily been available to hearing uh, retail previously. Thanks, Justin. Um, will audiologists be incentivized to sell new hearer products? And if so, how? Uh, look, for us, I think, uh, you know, it's it's a very that that whole audiological um, uh, process has been uh, upended, I guess, over the course of the last couple of months. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, yes, we've we've always provided incentives for audiologists to to sell our product. I guess their their focus hasn't necessarily been um, on on the mild to moderate hearing challenges. They 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 are focused on on selling of uh, hearing aids and devices. So uh, um, so from that perspective. Uh, we may see some some changes there from from a hearing healthcare perspective that that uh, um, audiologists uh, are more willing to to participate uh, 
in in a in the lower ends of the the hearing market. Um, um, but uh, yeah, the, the the incentives have have always been there. Um, but the 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 channel for us has been one that's um you know to date at least has been one that's been uh, you know better served elsewhere um, and something that uh, you have before you ultimately go and uh, have the need to see an audiologist. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can, you know, hearing healthcare encompasses a more broader, um, the smart hearing or the hearables market um, um, over, you know, that continues to build over the course of the next couple of, couple of years. Uh, just getting back to the SPP, has the company already been in contact with the largest shareholders to get an indication of how it will go? Yeah, positive. I mean, I think the response has been, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, we've got Canaccord there as, as an underwriter, but, you know, importantly, um, the, the shareholders uh, come first. So if they, they do want to participate, and yes, there is a, um, I had a very healthy um, response to, uh, to, to people wanting to participate. So that's, uh, that's super encouraging. Um, you know, the company has uh, nearly 4,000 shareholders. Um, so there is a, there's, a, there's a good opportunity here for, for people to, to participate. Um, and, uh, um, you know, um, early indicators are from, from our major shareholders that there is a gen genuine willingness to, to participate, which is great. Uh, thanks, Justin. Uh, question on the capital raise. Um, I think the shareholder letter this morning uh, discussed the rationale around the capital raise, but um, the, the question is specifically, um, it, it's a small capital raise. How, how far will it take the company forward? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a good question. I mean, you're, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't really. I think, you know, if we had gone too big, we would have been challenged on that as well, quite rightly. I don't think there's any right or wrong answer here necessarily. I mean, what we don't know is this is a changed world. Um, and uh, as a board, there's, there's you know, we, we wanted to to ensure that we can uh, continue to operate and grow as we are for for as long as we possibly can. So, you know, part of that was austerity. Um, the other part is ensuring we've got a treasury that uh, that'll see us ride out uh, what the, this storm that we're that we're in. Um, no one knows, and uh, I think from 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 our perspective, it was in, important to to continue to. Uh, to ensure that uh, you know things could get worse, we don't know. Um, main hopeful that they get a whole lot better, but uh, um, we're just putting ourselves in a position to uh, to allow us to uh, to continue to trade and grow, and uh, and obviously start to um, look after ourselves. Great, thanks. Um, you already discussed a little bit about uh, takeovers and OEMs and partnerships, etc. But there is a question here that's, that's sort of general. I don't know if you want to add to it. Um, um, why can't you hear, uh, find a financial backer, I presume, if opportunities are back to the There's so much blue sky. Um, uh, look, interesting question. I, th I think, uh, you know, we built um, a hearing, you know, um, a, a very good hearing device, um, and we've also built what is now um, proving to be, albeit fledgling, uh, a very um, good hearing category. Uh, we've been pioneers in that. Um, I think if you look over uh, historically, if you look at this particular part of the market, um, it's a potential graveyard. You know, the, the, the hearing aid companies have, have never been able to, to get deep penetration in this particular part of the market. Um, and I think that's a number of factors. I think it's device, I think it's, uh, um, um, I think it's um, form factor. I think it's uh, um, also the way you go about engaging a customer. So there's a number of things that have that have changed at that particular end of the market. What does that mean? If you're looking at this market, you're probably looking at it going, well, um, you know, can it be can it be successful? I mean, we've obviously got a a deep down belief that we can. Um, you know, we had a deep down belief five years ago when you know when we were building the widget, which no one thought we could build. Um, and uh, we're now on our third generation. We've got a deep down belief that this um, um, this part of the market, this segment, can be a very big one and a very successful one. So um, I think 
Um, the answer to that in a roundabout sort of way is that if we keep executing, then I think the interest will continue to rise. Um, the interest has been there. It's been there previously. Um, I don't think it's going away. And uh, um, But from our perspective, I, I just, um, th th there is a great opportunity here for, for us to be a standalone, successful global technology business. And, and for us um, at current levels, um, from a from a from investment market cap perspective, um, you know I'm obviously somewhat biased, but I believe we're completely undervalued in in relation to the size of the opportunity. So we need to, you know, there's a, there's a clear opportunity here to for us to 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 continue to drive sales over over the course of the next two quarters, and um, the rest ultimately will take care of itself. So um, um, so from that perspective, I think the partnerships we're seeking. Are the ones that we're doing with the Walgreens and the like. So, you know, where we can get, you know, the benefit of um, big um, membership bases that we can overlay our our marketing skills. Um, that represents significant opportunity. Um, I don't necessarily, you know, um, see us pushing out into, you know, um, more broader. Um, technology sharing and these sorts of things, although they you know there's still options available for us there, absolutely. Um, um, for us, our, our focus just has to remain on driving the business, growing the business, and uh, as I said, and I may, I may sound like a broken record, but the rest will certainly take care of itself. There's an opportunity here. We're committed to it. Um, we've got world best technology, world best product to apply to it, and. Uh, you know, we we believe we'll be very successful at the end of it. Thanks, jo thanks, Justin. Um, I think uh, we discussed the the expected delivery date for the um, IQ Max products, but um, there is a question here: manufacturing um, recommenced. Um, why the delay in orders? Did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, um, I mean the fact that we we have recommenced, the fact that we're you know uh, a lot closer to shipping our product now. Um, there's still a little bit of work to do for, in order for that to happen. But as I said, hopefully you know we're in that position um, um, before the end of the month that we uh, we have we have commenced that that, that shipping. Um, so importantly, we're we're on top of it. Um, as I said, it does have some frustrations in that we've got to do this remotely, um, but we've got a great manufacturing partner. Um, we've got a great uh, uh, engineering and operations team um, that will uh, that will see us through. So uh, you know, importantly, you know, we're not starting from scratch. We we uh, we're definitely uh, in the motions of uh, of reaching mass production, and uh, you know, quite frankly, that can't come soon enough. But uh, you know, there's just uh, um, there's just been things that have that have been beyond our control, and uh, unfortunately, that was initially through supply chain um, out of China. Having solved that. And commencing manufacturing it, then uh, Malaysia went into a to a halt. So, uh, but we're back up, and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, uh, well and truly, um, into mass production, cleared our back order, and, and into free stock very soon. Great. A um, question on your product, and I presume it's product type. But the question is, you know, why does New Hero only have one product, as in shape, size, and colour? Um, well, that's, that's a good question. I think a company of our size that, uh, you know, uh, we, we do have product. The Boost is still selling as a product, as, as an example. So there are multiple products out there. Um, and uh, Max has been built um, as a platform to, to, to spur multiple products, as, we, as we've articulated previously. Um, but we do get a lot of questions on colour. Um, and, you know, there's only one company in the world that sell white products on on any great scale and that's that's apple right and that's that's more of their trademark um, but 80 percent of uh headphones or earbuds that are sold on the market today are actually black so you know from our perspective where you know we we can't necessarily afford to have you know 100 different SKUs with 100 different colors or even five different SKUs of five different colors um while you while you're building this up the uh the opportunity is to um um uh, lays in the um, uh, uh, a single colour, you're going to go for the colour that 80% of people buy. 
Um, and I know that won't please all people, but at the end of the day, you know, it's it's also servicing our need um, in the sense that uh, you know we haven't got costs associated with with multiple uh, multiple SKUs. So um, I I like to think that over time um, we can get different colours out there, but as it stands today, um, I think you know money is better spent elsewhere um, than uh, than uh, applying different colours to to our particular product. But we we, we will look at um, uh, different types of products and how that that can uh, um, how IQ Buds Two Max can ultimately uh, deliver a uh, um, um, some different uh, different types of product offerings. Great, thanks, Justin. Um, there's another follow-up question on takeover and joint venture opportunities, slightly different, and the value of New Era. Has management been conditioned by the current share price? Sorry, has management been conditioned? I suppose you know. Uh, have you? Uh, oh, well, the way I'm interpreting this is, um, have you accepted? The, the, the current share price uh, in your view of takeovers and um, partnership opportunities? Um, well, from from my perspective, yeah, I you know I, I think we're massively massively undervalued. Um, is that is that the question? Sorry, I'm. I'm... Well, well, I think so. Um, uh, so, um, you know, specifically it said, has management been conditioned by the current share price? I mean, have we got used to seeing the share price where it is and therefore that's the value? But I suppose you're, you're saying that no, the not at all. share price I'm, doesn't reflect the value. I'm, yeah. I'm extremely disappointed as to where that, that share price is at. I mean, articulated as such in the, in the letter that we sent out today. I think, um, um, you know, given the level of investment that's been made uh, in the in the product, um, given the, the advancements that have been made um, in, in our marketing um, and in our sales, um, we um, we are in a position where um, we're going to be measured on our growth, and I, 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 I can accept that, right? And I think if you look at our evolution on the ASX and our market cap and our share price, you know we've gone through and. It, a lot of tech, unfortunately, goes through the same sort of, you know, you go through this this hyperbole of hype <laughs> um, rather than substance. And, you know, we've we've been through that, I guess, to a certain extent, and we're, we're driving ourselves um, and being measured on um, how realistic we can make this business grow. And uh, we accept that. And... I, I still think that uh, you know there's um, obviously a lot of room for growth in our business. Um, it, it's a it's a good story, um, and we believe that uh, a couple more consecutive quarters of growth, we're we're out of this um, um, this funk from a, from a share price perspective. But you know the I guess the COVID crisis has had its impact on every share um, from, from our perspective. Yeah, we believe we're, we've, uh, we've got an opportunity to, to really to, to grow our share price based on the results that we'll get over the over the coming quarters. Um, we're, we're, we're not relying on blue sky. I think well, hopefully what we pointed out today in the presentation is that uh, this, this is, we've got a serious understanding of our market and we've got a real ability to continue to grow. Great. Thanks, Justin. Um, just back to manufacturing. What is the capacity of the plant? Um, truly unlimited, really. Um, it's a function of how many different production lines you then have. So um, it's people in production lines and they can be replicated infinitum. So, you know, there's if if as and when we get significant scale, then it's it's just a process of um of people and uh and further production lines. So um so no, there's no real restriction in in that regard, um, and and the plant does major global name products, um, other headphone type products as well. So they they've got a good experience and um, a great deal of uh, capacity to to grow. So they'll, they'll service all our needs. Great, thanks, Justin. I've got another four or five questions. How are we going for time? Or 
we're probably 10 past 10, so we can we can maintain, finish a quarter past, so we maintain a couple more questions. I'm happy to answer them. I mean, it's, uh, yep, okay. Unreasonable questions. Um, can you please elaborate on your plan to develop a hearing aid? <laughs> um, not really. <laughs> I think the only thing that we would do in that regard is is in relation to OTC. Um, so an OTC will be a hearing aid specification. So, um, so you know, hearing aid means you know um, a, a different type of product. Um, you know, where we are a hearing bud today. So you know, we we are something you have before you get a hearing aid, and that's the way we position it. Um, and as I said, we're to, to date we're about filling that that unmet need. Um, but importantly, it, be, it makes good sense for us, you know, if we're capturing customers 18 years in advance of more traditional hearing aids, that there is uh, an offering that sits potentially between us and and uh, um, as, a, as a hearable or smart hearing device and a, and a more traditional hearing aid, um, and that's an OTC product. Um, so that that would be our next step. So we are uh, we are not sitting here intending to um, to compete with more traditional type hearing aids. They have their place and uh, and from, from our perspective that, that's not our market. All right, thanks. Um, why have you not looked at specific markets like uh, autism and ADP? Can you provide an update on ear science commission study? Look, we have looked at those, um, those markets. Um, and we do have a number of customers that are using our products for that. Um, we, I guess, are a relatively small um, uh, business, as, as people would know. Um, if and we do have, you know, a great deal of appeal around those specific parts of the markets, and that's where we get to the more the broadening of hearing healthcare is that our products do have opportunities to provide support for, for autism, APD, um, many years, um, and, and some of our avatars actually do, do um, go some part of the way in targeting that. Um, but we've got to be careful in terms of chasing every rabbit down every hole as well. And although there's opportunity there, um, we are on the NDIS for, for autism example. Um, I think our immediate focus is drive, you know, these um, uh, the, the areas that we we truly have developed an understanding of, um, which is um, um, the, this mild to moderate hearing challenges. Uh, focus on that, get growth on that, and then we can start to look at the, uh, other areas in terms of um, opportunity. But that's not to say that people aren't using the product for it and is a great solution for people in uh, in in those circumstances. Um, they're afflicted by uh, by those conditions, so um, there is opportunity there for us. Again, um, um, it's uh, it's more about focus for us, um, and uh, um, we we understand that you know our growth is our, our immediate growth can come from from where we're targeting today. And uh, um, um, you know, unfortunately, that means we can't necessarily get to everything in the short term. But the intention is over the over the course that we we can and will support. Um, more broadly, those uh, those conditions. All right, thanks, Justin. Um, I'll probably leave it at one question. There's there's about two or three that um, unfortunately we'll have to skip. But maybe if we um, uh, finish off with this one, uh, can you give more clarification around sales since the last quarter? Are they increasing? Um, Given that we haven't put that out to market, I think the answer to that is is no. I can't do that today. But I will say that we, you know, we are um, the um, uh, our our trend is continuing. Um, we we continue to uh, to sell more of our product. Those, those markets that were growing through the last quarter continue to grow for us. And uh, I uh, I think we will get an update over the course of the next week out on on. On exactly what did transpire in April, I think that I think that's fair. I think people understand that, um, and uh, I think we'll do an, an announcement over over the course of the next week, um, as and when we are able to finalise exactly 
uh, the numbers of, of April, but um, but yeah, we we continue to be encouraged by it. We we as I said, we've got a firm belief in our in ourselves um, and our and our way to uh, to continue to grow. Great, thanks, Justin. Look, we'll roll up the questions there. Um, our apologies if we didn't quite get to all the questions. We tried to get through as many as we could. Uh, we will be holding webinars in the future again, um, so there will be more opportunities to, to have a discussion with Justin. So with that, I'll, I'll just hand it over to you, Justin, just to conclude. Yeah, again, uh, thank, thank you, Steve, and thank you for everyone for attending. Um, uh, I hope uh, we've been able to answer a lot of, uh, a lot of questions um, today as well. Um, that was a good opportunity to, to do that. I hope we've been able to, with a, with a new presentation, highlight um, the opportunity that is presented to that business, and uh, and most importantly, highlight the opportunity that's presented to you as a as a shareholder um, to uh, to see a uh, a path to a what we what we trust is a significant return. So um, so with that, I'll uh, I'll sign off. I thank you. Um, please uh, stay safe. Um, and for those who have joined us in in other parts of the world, um, um, we uh, we hope that uh, um, you know the the crisis. Uh, uh, is, is short, and uh, we can all get back to uh, some form of normality over the course of uh, over the course of the coming months. But again, thank you, um, and uh, yeah, please, uh, if 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 we didn't get to your questions, then uh, please reach out to investor-relations at uh, newhero.com, and uh, we'll be happy to answer them. Thanks very much.